Like this. So, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, yeah, so, hi, I'm Philip. Uh, I want to talk a bit about observability and what it is or what it is not. Um, there is one small disclaimer. While I generally work for Elastic, I'm, I'm here on vacation because we don't do business travel yet. Um, so, I, I'm just Philip and um, yeah, you can, you can buy me a beer afterwards, but I'm here on vacation, so I'm not really officially here. Um, you don't even see me. Um, so, let's talk a bit about the topic. Um, if you have any questions and you, you are shy and you don't want to ask, um, or you don't want to ask in English, um, I, I have Slido set up, so you can just use slido.do slash Xera, which is also my Twitter handle and everything, um, or you can use the QR code and you can throw in any questions there. And I will go through the questions at the end. Um, if I run out of time, I think we will have enough time. But if I run out of time, I will just tweet out any other answers or anything that is left. But if you have any questions, and please feel free to interrupt me at any point in time. But if you're unsure and you just want to type it, throw it on Slido, and we can run through the questions afterwards um, so everybody can get their questions in. So um, let's see what we even have here. Who is using logs? I assume pretty much everybody who is awake um, still um, will raise their hand because that's kind of the, the common thing that everybody is doing. Um, so logs, as we all know, and what you normally do is you print what happened, and it's very much on the, the component level. So what is nice on logs is that it's pretty easy to set up, and everybody has been using them. What is kind of like complicated about logs is like, yeah, you need to write the good log message and the right log level, otherwise it will be all chaos. And it's very much on a component level. So you, you have like at this point in, in the code, something happens and you write a statement, um, but you don't have much context around it. That's kind of the, the downside of that. Um, next up, who is using metrics? I think that's probably fewer, but still a lot. So where you get some periodic measurement of something like how much is my heap usage in Java? Or my, how much CPU are we using? How much network? Um, so you have like a nice overview. And the good thing about that is that it's aggregatable. And you can get like an overview of how is the system behaving in general. What is very hard with metrics is figuring out like why something is bad. So you can see that we have a high heap usage, but that number alone will be very hard to pinpoint like why is the heap high. You can see that it is high, but it's hard to figure out why that is. Um, so that's kind of like the downside of metrics. Um, then there is APM for application performance monitoring or tracing. Who is using that? And that's normally even fewer. Um, the, the idea behind tracing is pretty much that you, especially in Java, you just have like this Java agent concept where you attach it to your application. And you don't have to write these statements where you spit out the log message, but your application is instrumented by that Java agent normally. And the, the way it changes the approach is that it suddenly switches from that component level, like at this point in, co in the code, it changes to the request level or scope. So it cares about like the request of a user comes in, and then basically it follows that request of the user throughout your entire application until you give the response back. Um, so it normally generates a unique ID for the request, and then as the request works its way through your system, it will keep that ID, and you can always follow and see how that thing is working. And how it changes that here is that it's really the, the application level, and you have this entire scope, especially if you have like a distributed application or something that is a microservice, whatever that might be, um, then you can have a much better overview of where you're spending your time, where are the errors happening, what is even communicating with what. Um, so it's much more on the overall overview and request scope rather than just a component level. Um, and then the, the question is that always comes up, because it's very fancy buzzword nowadays, what is observability? And then everybody is, hmm. And you might have seen this one here, this aggregation. And a lot of people call these the, the three pillars of observability, because you take these three things together. You have logging, metrics, and traces. You mesh them up, and that's observability. 
or not, as we will discover in the next 30 minutes or so. Um, what is nice about this graphics and what you can see here is that you have these different intersections of um, where you can be. So logging, you have a, an event, but if you combine it with tracing where you have these unique IDs, then you have a request scoped event. So you can then add a unique ID to your log levels or your log events. And then based on that unique ID, you could say, give me all the log messages for that specific user or request that somebody has been generating. So you have more context around it. And you can then have request scope metrics. So you could see all the response times for one request or one specific user, for example, if you carry that around. Um, or you could have metrics and logs combined, where you have some numbers, for example, in your logs that you log with them, and then you could have aggregatable yeah, numbers around them. And the center is basically where you want to be, where you have all three combined, where you have request scoped aggregatable events. So it's the request scope, where it's like this was one request. Um, you can aggregate those, and you still have the events like the log events that you have collected. So this is observability, right? We are done for today. Maybe not quite. Um, so calling this observability is pretty much like saying Formula One is made out of gasoline, motor oil, and tires, um, which is not wrong, but it's maybe not the, the essence of Formula One and why people might watch Formula One every Sunday when it's on. Um, so while Logs, metrics, and traces are part of observability and kind of like make that up. Formula One is also made up of gasoline, but that's still not the essence of the thing. So, yeah, that's not it. What is it? Um, and what we have seen before is something like this. Probably if you have ever been to a DevOps talk, you saw something like this, where vendors come in and say, like, we have DevOps tools. And now we have kind of the same thing where people say, like, we have observability tools, um, and we'll get to that. But how did we even end up there, and why do we even need this observability thing? And probably you have used monitoring to some degree in the past. Like, why is monitoring not good enough today anymore? Why do you want more than monitoring? And it's a bit coming from the pets versus kettle side. I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with that. Like, pets, where I remember back. 20 years ago or so, when I got my first virtual server, it was my pet. I gave it a name. I raised it by hand by installing all the packages. When it was sick, I would care for it and try to, to fix it because I could never recreate that mess that I had created by hand anyway. Um, that was your old infrastructure. Your new infrastructure is Kettle, where it doesn't have a, a nice name. It has like some auto-generated name. Um, you don't raise it by hand, but it's being automatically set up with Terraform and Ansible or whatever you use for automation. And if that server is sick, you just kill it and replace it with a new one because it's raised automatically. That is pretty much like pet versus kettle. And kind of like in infrastructure, we have also switched these concepts um, where we have gone from that beloved static monolith um, that you could deploy by hand and you could install all the dependencies to something that is much more complicated, where it's like elastic microservice architecture, which you cannot just install anymore by hand, but it's like a lot of automation and tooling in the background that makes that work and happen. Um, or looking at it another way is that back in the days, it was pretty simple. Like we had our little person, and yeah, you have that cloud. Um, but basically, you might have a load balancer, and then you have the monolith, and then you have a database, and then you get data back. And there, like having a log statement worked because you have one application and you can basically follow stuff along in the log and you can just tail that log file and you, you know what's going on. It's all good. Um, then, nowadays it's like the better times for vendors, I like to say, because if your application looks something like this, which is pretty messy potentially, um, where you have multiple databases and lots of services talking to each other and to various databases, if you write the log message in this one here, it doesn't tell you much about the entire state of the system. You're not going to learn much. Like You can tail that log file, but it's not telling you anything about the entire state of the application or what a user is seeing. So you need much more tooling, um, which is um, great. Tools everywhere, right? Um, 
which is pretty much like what DevOps has become. Um, so the, the idea of DevOps was that you break down the silos and people work together and it's not dev throws something over the fence to ops and says like, good luck is your problem now to run this in production for the next few years. Um, but it's like to break down that silo and work better together. Um, it then became tools, jobs, departments, and other things, which was not the idea. Um, but well, there are reasons for that. And one of the reasons, for example, is if you look at that, um, if you call yourself system engineer in the US, um, that's your salary range, your, so approximately you make 100K a year. Now, if you replace your title with DevOps and call yourself De DevOps, you suddenly earn 19% more, just because it's like a fancier title and that's what everybody wants to do. Um, so that's why all the companies and all your management says, like, we should do DevOps. And now, all the tool vendors who have been doing monitoring in the past will say, like, we should do observability, because then we can also charge X percent more for everything, because it's what everybody wants and needs. Um, which is, of course, kind of a joke. So what is observability? Because I've kind of been talking for 20 minutes or so now what observability is not or what it is related to. Um, so what is observability? Um, there's this nice definition. Um, a system is observable if the behavior of the entire system can be determined by only looking at its inputs and outputs. Um, and that might be a great definition and where it comes from, from control theory, um, but that didn't answer your question either. Um, so what is observability? Um, one way to look at it is this small table where you have known and unknown things. So known and known um, are the things that you are, are aware of and you can know, for example, that this might break. That is when you put together a little dashboard to look like, is this thing working the way it should be? Because you know it can break. So this is the known knowns, the problems that you know about and you know that you need to monitor. That is kind of where monitoring com is coming in. Um, it's a bit like scar tissue, like things that broke in the past and you need to watch out for in the future. Um, unknown knowns is things that you are like, you are kind of aware um, that something might happen there, but you have never experienced a problem there. So that is, for example, where you might have some machine learning or anomaly detection that learns over time, like this is how some latency is behaving or some load on the system is behaving. And then it will tell you like, hey, this is not the ordinary anymore. Um, something is going wrong. Um, you might want to, to look into that. Um, the unknown knowns are the things that we are aware of but do not really understand. That's normally when you have a lot of log messages in your code so you can enable or increase the log level that you can see just more stuff around what is happening. So you're not really sure what is going wrong, but you're kind of mentally prepared to have more log statements and then you turn it to debug to maybe figure out what is happening there. And then you have the unknown unknowns. These are the things that you have never thought about and you don't really know how to debug or where to get started. And that is really where kind of like the idea of observability is coming in, that your code is instrumented and without redeploying a new version, you can just look into more details and drill into your data by just collecting a lot of more, more of the raw data behind it rather than just having exactly what you know what will break. So collecting a lot of that raw data and especially around tracing and richer events is what will enable you to debug unknown unknowns. Um, and then people are like, what are these unknown unknowns and why should I care about them? And, and one interesting thing about like what kind of like makes it different between monitoring of the old and where observability is coming in is the survivorship bias. And I'm not sure you have seen this one. Um, this was a thing in the Second World War where the, the British, I think, looked at the, the fighter planes coming back from Germany, looking where they have bullet holes in the plane. And then they were thinking, like, what should we do? And the initial idea that you have is, like, you reinforce the plane where the bullet holes are, right? But that's kind of like a wrong idea because what you care about are the planes that don't come back, which basically means the bullet holes, if you have like a bullet hole here or here, where the planes without them come back, this, these are the planes that will not come back. So these are basically the parts that you want to reinforce because that's the actual problem. The other ones like where you have all the, the red dots, like that's fine, the plane will still survive you want to kind of like figure out like how to reinforce the plane in the other parts because we assume that the bullet holes are kind of like 
um, evenly distributed across the plane. So the things where you don't have the holes are the things that you want to focus on. And that's kind of like the, the monitoring approach is very much like you look for the bullet holes and you try to reinforce the bullet holes. And the observability is a bit more like thinking like, why is the plane not coming back with the bullet holes elsewhere? And how can I make that system better there? So that's the idea behind that. Um, and the general idea behind all of that is um, you want to expose state and answers. Um, so you want to know what is the status of my system? What is not working and why is it not working? So it's not just having like a fancy dashboard that will show you like, oh, the error rate is too high and everything is broken. But it's really figuring out like why is it too high? Like is a service down? Is some latency too high? Did my database stop? Did I have like an an error in my database schema or whatever. Like, why is stuff breaking and not working the way it should be? Um, another nice comparison is that monitoring is a bit like your bank telling you that your bank account is overdrawn. And observability is telling you that you don't have any money left because you spent it all on chocolate cakes and sweets. So that's kind of like the observability part is figuring out this why, and not just like, while well, showing you the curve that it's like all red and in the minus. So that's kind of like the idea there. Or another way to look at it, and that might be more of a discussion starter, and this is a bit small potentially to read, um, but the big difference is that um, here, this, this, the left-hand side, this is like the, kind of like the monitoring way, and this is more the observability way. And on the left-hand side, you bring in data, um, you can expire it, and you build a nice dashboard showing you what is going on, and then maybe you build a, a threshold checker on, on that, and you might throw an alert. And in the observability way, rather than just looking at the metrics, you collect all the details in the background. So this, like here, this would be like the, your bank account, and like you add up all the plus and minus, or money coming in and going out, and then you have a plus or a minus at the end. Whereas here you have the statements of like, this is what you spend your money on. And this would then tell you like, hey, here you bought the cake, and here you bought some sweets, and this is why you're overdrawn. So it's like much richer raw data than just like the overview of what is happening in your system. And then you can have some pattern matching to say like, this is not something that I have seen before, so you should look into this and potentially fix it or make it better. Um, so while monitoring is often very much about like numbers and like seeing how stuff has been behaving in the past and you know what is the problem, um, observability is much more going deeper, which will also mean you need to collect a lot more information and you will need to spend more time and effort on that. Um, and yeah, some trap that you might fall into or your vendors try to push into you into is um, it's pretty much the same what you had with containers. Like you have your crappy software and you push it into a container and bam, you're cloud native, right? Um, so even if you put COBOL into a container, then you're cloud native, or maybe not. Um, and the same thing is basically what is happening with monitoring and observability. Um, that the monitoring vendors will say like, yes, we will basically put that new sticker on us like we're doing observability even though it's the same thing that you've had before. Um, so it's pretty much like, throwing the, the COBOL application into a container that doesn't really make it cloud native, um, even if you can pretend that. Um, what you want to do instead is you want to instrument your application um, so you understand what is going on without shipping new code, so you know your system. Um, because why don't you want to ship new code? Mostly because when you restart your application, that weird bug is not showing up anymore. And it will only come back at 3 a.m. on a Friday when you're out to drink with your friends and then you need to debug drunken um, from a bar or so. So you don't want to do that. Um, so the, the trick is you don't want to redeploy your application with more log statements, for example, but you want to have that instrumentation where you can collect more information all the time and then just slice and dice into that to figure out what was that problem. Um, Another way to look at it also, or that is kind of important to remember, is like um, trying to understand how, how, a, how marriage works only by looking at divorces is probably not a very healthy approach to relationships. And that's kind of what we are doing with monitoring and observability many times, or at least monitoring in the past. Like you would only look at the system when it was broken, and you would never see like how should the system behave. And that's why you didn't really know what to even expect. 
Only when customers call and say like, hey, something is broken, or your CTO storms in and shouts at you because something is slow or not working, and then you open the dashboard, and then you see some weird curves, and you don't really know what they should be. And it's pretty much the same thing if you just look at divorces, then you don't really know how a proper marriage should work. Um, and the same thing is with monitoring, that you probably shouldn't just look at things when they are broken, but like how they work when they behave the way they should behave. So you have like a baseline understanding how how that makes sense. Okay, so you collect all the things, right? And then you drown in data and you don't see anything anymore. That's kind of the other thing that you see every now and then. Like if you log everything, and if everything is important, then nothing is important at the end. So you need to realize that not all si signals and things are the same. Um, so for example, as a user, or what a user cares about is much more important than what you might have in some log statement or some metric in the background. So that a user can log in is very important, and that is something that you should care, take care of. Um, or that you can do a shopping transaction, or you can do a search operation in a fast way, um, that your shopping cart is consistent and doesn't lose any items when you go to the next step. Those are all important things because your users will care about them. If the API is not available, but your application can work around that, not so much of a problem. If the error rates spike, but nobody on the front end actually sees that because you have some retry mechanism, or because it's just a component that you could dynamically turn off, probably you don't care about that that much, and you don't want to wake somebody up in the middle of the night. So not all the signals are equal. What affects the user directly is something you want to look into. If it's just something like, oh, a data, the database latency is a bit higher, probably nobody really cares about it. Or maybe you want to look at it, but you don't want to wake up at 3 a.m. to look into that, because if it doesn't affect the user, why should you care? Um, which is another interesting point, then when you collect everything, that's probably too much, and it's also getting very expensive. So if you collect every single request and you store a lot of information about every single request coming to your system, depending on how many requests you have, that will be a lot of data and too much. Um, so you normally want to sample. And sampling basically means you only keep a certain percentage of the data or requests that are coming in. And there are generally two ways to, to do that. So there is um, head or tail-based sampling or none. None means you collect everything. If you're rich, you can do that. Um, if you're not so rich, maybe you don't want to do that and you want to be a bit more clever about it. Um, Head-based sampling basically means a request comes in and the first service that gets that request will make the decision, do I want to collect all of that information, yes or no? And there you could just say, like, I want to collect only 1% of the requests because I assume 1% is a good representation of all the rest of the requests. And then you make the decision, which works and is simple, but it's also very stupid. Why? Because what you care about are normally things that are slow or fail. And that's where tail-based sampling comes in. So tail-based sampling, for example, says like, I look at the request at the end and will make the decision at the very end of the request if this was interesting and I want to keep this. And interesting means it has errored or it took longer than a certain threshold. Um, so it was slow, for example. Because those are the interesting things and the, want, the ones you want to look into. So you want to keep those and spend your time, effort, and money on those interesting things rather than the, the request that got back at 200 and took five milliseconds, because you're not going to learn much from that one. Um, unless, like I said, you're rich, then you can collect everything, but especially for larger systems, most of us are not rich um, or don't want to spend that much money. Um, finally, what is important here are service levels, and I assume most of you have some service level agreements. Um, so there is a service level indicator, that is, for example, the uptime of my application, and you have the service level objective, which means, for example, you want to have 99% uptime of your service. And then you might have a service level agreement either internally against other teams or against customers, which will basically mean you breach that agreement and then you owe somebody money. That's kind of the, the gist of it. No, you don't always have to pay that directly, but that's kind of like what you have agreed to that you will provide, and then you should be doing that. And that's how you look at that. And that is generally a good idea. Just don't go crazy because like very high uptime, for example, is getting very expensive. And the funny thing is that GitHub's uptime, for example, is not as great as it could be. I 
I assume most of us would agree here, every time GitHub is not working the way it should be and every, nobody can work. Um, yet, that didn't stop Microsoft from buying GitHub for $7 billion. Um, so maybe your application doesn't need five nines in the end. Unless you make pacemakers, then maybe you should have like higher availability. Um, I think there was this story, I, the, the pacemaker thing I can think comes up because once there was like a bigger outage in AWS in one availability zone, and then people were, were writing messages on the, the forum to get their stuff quickly up, and then one pacemaker provider was saying, well, we were only using one single availability zone on Amazon, which is probably not such a smart idea um, because people might die because of you. Um, but unless you do that, it might not be so important to have like super high availability because others are doing fine without that. So just be reasonable and figure something out that makes sense. Um, one thing that is important to think about or remember, a lot like DevOps, you cannot buy observability. Like, you cannot buy DevOps. Um, I mean, people will come to you and try to sell you DevOps, um, but you cannot buy it. Um, so you can get tools that will enable you to do things around DevOps, like the process, but you cannot buy the process itself. It's a lot like observability. And one very simple example just to show you. Let's assume I have one of the three pillars of observability logs, because it's the most widely used one. So I might have, oops, ah, that was the wrong button. Here. Um, let's say we have a classic log, like we have. So first off, it's, a, it's not just a log line, it's a JSON message, so it has some structure, and my application can work more nicely with that, and I don't need to write the regular expression to parse that out afterwards. Um, so you have a log level, and you have a timestamp, and you have the log message, Philip failed to log in with whatever password I was trying to use here, and you have even a service name, so you know where it happened, and you even know which, um, yeah, which package and class that is coming from. Um, which is all nice, but in an automated way, this still doesn't show you really what is going on, because a human will need to read that log message to figure out what is going on here. What you really want to have instead is you want to restructure your log messages to have some more structure around it. So you might, or you will still want to have that log message here, but you also want to have some more automation um, or like more explicit fields around it to work with that. So here I have like an event category which is login failure, and then I have extracted the user and the IP address and for example the URL. And that information will make it easier for me to aggregate the data and then slice and dice into it. So I don't need to read through a million log messages to see like, are a lot of users failing to log in? Or is somebody trying to brute force my login? Having that more explicitly will allow you to actually quickly create a visualization or filter down on the data to see. And then you will be able to see like, is it a lot of users who fail to log in? Then probably you have screwed up the login service. Is it just one IP address that is creating lots of failed logins? then probably somebody is trying to brute force some accounts on your end, and you might want to block that IP address. Um, is it just one user that is desperate and trying to log in and fails? Maybe support wants to follow up with that user. But only if you have like a bit more of that structure and can aggregate the data and get an overview of what is happening, you can really make sense of it and get a feeling of how to work with your data. Um, otherwise, you need a lot of interns to read log messages and stare at dashboards, but that might not be the idea of what you want to do. Um, and one more thing is that while logs, metrics, and traces might be the pillars of observability, they're not the only thing. Um, you might want to have other things, like um, some people consider alerting very important there, because without the proper alerts, well, you're basically shouting into the void and nobody's reacting to it, so observability probably needs alerts. Or maybe security is important because without proper security, you should not be running your system and you want to tie security information into what you're collecting around it otherwise. Or you want to have some health checks or like uptime monitoring where something pings your application to see like, is it actually working? So you might have a very simple workflow, for example, where putting something into the shopping cart and checking out that a bot is doing that every minute automatically for you. So rather than waiting for users to complain to you, your bot will tell you, hey, your, your standard workflow is broken. Look at that, fix that. 
that might be a very good addition to what you get from logs, metrics, and traces just to figure out what is broken rather than waiting for your customers to call customer service and at some point customer service escalating to you because that will take a lot of time and will make a lot of users mad and will not help your application. Um, so what is the overall goal? As always, the business value. Um, you're not just building a system for itself. You don't do observability just because it's nice and fun. I mean, some of us might do that, but that's not the overall goal. Um, I mean, yeah, I know. It's like using Kubernetes. You don't have to, but you want to. Um, so yeah, you can also do observability because of that. Um, but generally, the idea is to increase business value and figure out why things are broken and how to make them better for your users and answer the complicated problems. On a more personal level, maybe you want to do that so you won't be paged unnecessarily at 3 a.m. at the bar um, because you don't want that. So to wrap up and leave some time for questions. Um, monitoring was kind of the things where something you know if the system is not uh, working. So you know that the system is not working, but you don't really know why. Um, observability is more like a property of the system, why it is not working. And like I said, observability is nothing that you can buy. It's really more of a property of a system. So you make it observable, or it is observable, so you can see how that is going. But it's not something that you have or have not. It's pretty much like security that is like an ongoing effort to increase it and keep it growing in your application, like observability that inside. And yeah, repeat after me. Um, you cannot buy DevOps or observability, um, but I can sell it to you. Um, and Elastic happens to sell a lot of observability tooling, so we can talk about that. We, we have a booth as well. Um, Anyway, um, if you want to see all of that a bit more hands-on, um, in the next time slot in room three, I think I will have a talk for tracing for Java developers to make all of this a bit more hands-on to actually look at how does tracing work, what is tracing, how does it work in my Java application. Um, because this talk is much more like a, a fun overview of what observability might be and might give you as, in terms of overview. Um, but it didn't answer any concrete questions, I think. So. Did anybody put any questions on Slido? Or if you have any questions, just shout. Um, I guess I'll have to repeat for the recording or the stream. Um, did anybody put any questions on Slido? Uh, oh, that's my second screen. So. OK, looks like everybody was shy and did not ask any questions. Do we have any questions here right now? Yes, um, shout, and I'll, I'll repeat the question. Yes, so the question was, um, adding instrumentation to Java is, is easy, thanks to the Java agent concept, I assume. Um, how does that work for compiled languages like Go where it is not? Yes, so for, for Go, it's, or let me try to approach it differently. So I will always say that Java is kind of special because of the dash Java agent concept. I think .NET Core has something similar, where it's basically, you can't just attach at runtime to it. Most other programming languages, even if not compiled, don't have that. Like even in Node, Ruby, Python, whatever, I will need to instrument the, or monkey patch in some way, um, my instrumentation into it. So at least I, somewhere in the starting process, I will need to call that instrumentation explicitly. With stuff like Go, where it's really compiled, it's even worse because then you will need to write your wrappers manually or explicitly around that. So there are libraries um, that you can in and I think open telemetry is kind of like what everybody wants to use nowadays, so it's also not vendor specific. But in your application, you only have like a generic standard. But it is much more manual, yes. You will need to wrap, I don't know, the incoming HTTP calls, for example, or whatever. Um, I don't think there is like a, a magic or good fix for that. 
Is that like an answer or is that? Or, I mean, it's not a solution. It's, let, let's say it's an answer, but it's not a solution. Um, yeah, yes. So, yeah, Java is kind of like fortunate or special. Um, and other languages are, are harder to instrument because you don't have that nice concept with Java agent where you basically change the entry point into the application. So all of your code gets instrumented or you can automatically wrap everything without changing your jar. So the development team writes the application and the operations team might add the instrumentation at runtime any, any instrumentation they might want. Um, so you have a nice separation and it doesn't interfere with each other. Um, yeah, more complicated with other languages. Yeah. So the question was, um, with tail-based sampling, or I guess sampling in general, how do you make sure it's not biased? And that is a very complicated problem. Um, my, my favorite example for that is, um, let's assume you have a, an application that gets lots of requests, and you take just like a certain percentage of those, and then you have like a big batch job running every night. Um, if you collect that one big batch job, yes or no, um, will make a big difference of how your entire application looks. So there is totally the risk of bias, and I don't think there is like a, a generic way to make sure you can avoid it. I think some of the approaches are oftentimes that um, you might have counters internally, so the decision of what should be sampled is not just purely random, um, but it might say like sample every every code path or every class at least 10 times. And if it happens the 11th time, then, then only take some. And you can, with tail-based sampling, you might want to do the same, where you might have something that is more representative, and you might have like the happy path as well, and not just the bad path. Um, it depends a bit on, on how you set it up and how you want it and where you see the trade-offs. And tail-based sampling is something that I think it's an interesting idea, but it, in a lot of implementations, it's still more in progress than done. Just because collecting everything is easier, kind of like what is already there. Head-based is very simple because you basically flip a coin and then in 10% of the cases or whatever you set, you collect it. Tail-based is a bit more complicated. And then you always have this bias problem of the batch job or like this one odd thing that only happens very rarely that you always collect that. So that would normally require some, some kind of counter for the, the, the classes that you call or the code paths that you collect everything and not just like randomly something and miss out on important other pieces. Um, cool. Other questions? Also, I wanted to... Normally, I, I will always say I, I'll document for work what I've been doing since I'm here privately. Um, I'll, I'll still document what, I, what we've been up to. Um, can you all wave? Thank you. Um, I haven't seen live people in like 18 months or so. <laughs> um, any other questions? We've still got 10 minutes left. Yes, please. Yeah, so since I'm working for a vendor, I'm very biased. Um, so um, Elastic has a great tool set for those. Um, so in the end, I think it, it will very much depend on what you have and what everybody will feel comfortable with. I think logs, metrics, and traces to some degree have established themselves. What I would say what the, the future will look like is, or it looks like, um, open telemetry has kind of won. So the general idea is you have open telemetry, which is like an open API standard, but also implementation. And you have that one implementation that you add to your code. And then you can still switch out the backends. That my other talk, talk afterwards will look a bit more into that, that you use open telemetry, so you have something generic. Because you don't want to write like, or I would be careful to write some vendor-specific thing all over your code base, because if you want for some reason to replace it later on, 
um, that will be a lot of work and it will be very annoying. Um, that's really the power of open telemetry that it's like generic or like approachable for everybody, that you have that instrumentation that you can apply to your application. And then basically there is an open telemetry exporter, which is like a proxy. And there you could configure like the backend of where that information should be stored. So if you're rich, you could forward the data to Splunk. And if you're not so rich, um, you could forward it to, I don't know, Elasticsearch, because you can run that for free, or what are, whatever other backend you have. Um, but it doesn't change anything in your code. It's just like where you forward it. And then kind of like the, the battle between the vendors is very much about like who can store data more efficiently, who has better visualizations, where can you drill down in your data, who has better machine learning and alerting and all of these things. And coming back to the actual question, so what I'm using are, is the Elastic toolset because the way to stay fresh with your own tool set is mostly that I, I try to use that. Um, I do look at the competition, though I, I normally don't use it that much. So what I would use is to collect the log files, I would, I would write out the adjacent log file. So it's structured because I don't write, like to write regular expressions. I will always jokingly say that if you like writing regular expressions, it's like the Stockholm Syndrome. You got so used to doing that that at some point you accepted it. Um, so I hope that was clear for everybody. Like, if you have the log message, like you have the log level and the timestamp, you want to extract those that you can say, like, give me only the errors or the one messages in my log message. So you want to extract those pieces of code. And to do that would normally be a regular expression. And then I would tail that with FileBeat, for example. For, for metrics, I could use MetricBeat that can collect it from Prometheus, from the system level, whatever. Um, there's an Elastic APM agents for various environments, though they also tie into open telemetry. Um, so you have all those different pieces um, to collect that. Um, did that kind of answer the question or not? Kind of. Okay, if you, if you want to dive deeper into it, um, we can. If you have like observability questions, um, I'm around for the entire day. You can also come to the booth. Um, I, I mean, what I'm using personally, I can demo you there. Um, but yeah, it's like my, my soul is sold. Um, you will need to make your own decisions. Other questions? We still got like seven or eight minutes left. Or is everybody ready for the next round of coffee? Yes, sorry, yes. Yes. Yeah, so the, the question was, if I have tail-based sampling, how may, do I make that more efficient without shoving too much data around? And that is unfortunately a very complicated problem. Um, also for our stack, for example, um, and let me shortly elaborate on that. So the, the thing is, I mean, you always have, so that there, there are two things that you need to think of. Like there is in-band and out-band communication around tracing or telemetry normally. In-band is like the header that the request keeps as it goes from one service to the next that you know what belongs together. And out-band is how to ship that information out of the actual application into the, the tracing backend or observability backend. Um, so the, the in-band you always need because you always need to keep that unique ID. And with the head-based sampling, it's easy because you decide this gets sampled, you basically set the flag, you generate the unique ID, and then if the set flag is set, you will ship all the metadata out in the outband channel and, and store that, and you're done. With the this tail based one, yeah, you have the problem that you still try to, will have to collect all the information and need to centralize it, because in a microservice architecture or distributed architecture, um, you might have five different services on five different instances. So you will need to centralize the data that is kind of like in motion at some point, and then potentially you just throw everything away before forwarding it. Um, but I don't think there is an easy or good way around that. So what you normally have, especially for larger systems, is that you have this OLTP exporter from OpenTelemetry, which is like a proxy, and you will run one per availability zone or one per maybe per instance is too much, um, but you will run multiple ones to kind of like have that locality. 
And if you make the decision there, then you can ship it out afterwards or discard it, but you keep it more or less local. But what you obviously don't want to do is you don't want to ship like half a meg of data across availability zones or whatever in, in AWS because the, the, the price just for the network traffic will be high. Um, and then for Elastic, what I was referring to after, before was that um, the way Elasticsearch, for example, writes data is immutable, so that constantly updating thing like there's more data coming is a very stupid pattern for us. Um, so we are building like an, an aggregation layer on the, the so-called APM server to aggregate that and have one transaction at the very end, but to have like also a proxy in between to collect all the right information and then write it out in one batch and not not like have multiple requests in flight that need to be combined because it's, it's a bad write pattern for us. Um, but that is like a, a general problem of the, the tail-based sampling that, yeah, you will need to s kind of like at least aggregate more data at a proxy level uh, at some point, but do it at the local proxy and that will hopefully keep the cost lower and down. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Four minutes left, final, final chance. Otherwise, if everybody is happy, thanks so much for joining. Um, by the way, um, I always forget. Um, obviously, if you wanted to get any of the information, um, you can get the current slides at the QR code. Um, so if you wanted to, to look at that again, um, be my guest. Um, other than that, thanks a lot for joining. I'm heading to my next session, so if you want to see that hands-on, follow me um, along. And Otherwise, come to the booth and say hi. Thank you.